Okay, we're gonna give it two minutes and we're gonna start right on time today. There's a lot going on uh, with the meal today. <clears throat> For those of you that have been watching the stream uh, from last week, we're, this week we're preparing salmon. Hopefully some of you are outside enjoying the weather. I'm not anticipating a big showing today, but uh, you can follow this at a later time. So today we're gonna to be producing um, seared Atlantic salmon with spiced Israeli couscous and we're doing a mango relish with some fresh asparagus and some pen blistered tomatoes. Okay, so we'll give it another minute. So just 30 seconds more and we'll start up. Okay viewers, so uh, as discussed a couple of minutes ago, today's meal will be seared Atlantic salmon. We're going to be serving that today with a spiced Israeli couscous and a mango relish and some beautiful vegetables, some spring asparagus and some plant pan blistered tomatoes, okay? So we'll get right into uh, today's meal. So we'll talk a little bit about the fish we're using today and a lot of questions that come up occasionally is farmed versus wild, okay? We had the option of doing both. The reason I went with uh, this variety, which is typically a farmed uh, salmon, is because the only uh, product that I had available in the wild form was frozen. So I wanted to use fresh for the video today. Uh, but whenever available, wild is always the way to go. Okay. Uh, reason, the, the main reason you could tell that this is a farm product is because of the color is a little bit less uh, red, whereas wild salmon could be a little bit deeper orange to red color. And there's a lot more fat in, in a, a farmed Atlantic salmon versus a wild, which is typically leaner, okay? Uh, the reason going wild versus farmed is because of uh, not necessarily, people talk about mercury levels and there's some discussion whether or not the mercury in wild versus uh, farmed is higher. There are some um, discussions that a farm product has far less mer mercury than a wild salmon and there are some discussions that are the exact opposite. Uh, but it's mainly due to the farm product and the confines and what they're fed. So there's a lot of discussion as they add uh, a product that induces coloration into the salmon itself because in the wild they don't need that. They eat a lot of uh, uh, byproducts of uh, shrimp and that'll give it the, the bright red color. Uh, so it's mainly due to feed and, and typically the Atlantic salmon that's farmed tends to be fattier. Uh, now salmon itself has really high amounts of omega-3, which is extremely healthy for you, for brain function, bone density, uh, has a lot of great attributes, but it's always wild tends to have a more positive uh, amount of mineral and vitamin uh, than the farmed, okay? But both great products. In terms of mercury levels, salmon tends to have the least of all the fish uh, that's out there, but wild again, uh, typically the amount of uh, positives using wild versus farmed is, is definitely a plus, okay? So I'll show you a little bit what I did. These are the portions that we're gonna use today. So some beautiful, some beautiful four to five ounce salmon. What I've done, and I'm gonna show you on this piece, I've taken the upper part of the loin, and I'm gonna tell you some things when you buy at the grocery store or at the monger that you have to watch for, okay? So I'm gonna show you just here, I'm gonna put this to the side. And I'm gonna show you here with this piece of fish that I did not uh, trim. So typically that's the way you're gonna receive it in the grocery store, okay? 
So what you're going to see here is this is the belly of the fish, which would be great if we were using it for uh, a soup or a stock or something like that. Typically you don't use a fatty fish for a stock, you'll use a white fish uh, like cod bones or halibut bones are great for fish stock. But I mean if that's what you have then it still produces an excellent stock, it's just a little bit fattier. So I would trim back the belly like that and this would be typically stock. Okay, so I'd get rid of that and use it for a stock. The belly part here, because of the uh, uneven thickness of the salmon, I would trim this away in the restaurant, okay? I would use this, trim it, take the skin off, and I would typically use this for my soups, okay? So I would trim this down to about here, remove the skin, and then I would save this and I could use it in a beautiful chowder, okay? Now, as far as this piece goes, what you have to watch for. So when I flip it over, you can see, and I checked this earlier uh, with the pieces that I have here, and this has already been scaled. If it hasn't, you can buy a scaler at any of your local uh, restaurant supply store typically have scalers. You can create one. In the old days, we used to make them. Or you can, if you're comfortable, you can just use your knife and you're just gonna go against uh, the way the scale's running. So if it's running this way, you're gonna go the opposite way. Just run your knife back and back that direction and that's gonna remove some of the excess scale. So you can see the monger did a pretty good job, but he didn't remove all of the scales. And that's something that you don't want to eat. It won't do you any harm, but it's just unpleasant. Okay. So that's something that I would definitely remove. And then there's a small flap of fat at the back here. And again, it won't do you any harm if you don't remove it, but I tend to remove it. I just go back here with my knife and I'll just cut right across here. Okay. And just remove that part as well. Okay, now what I've done, and I'll show you with the pieces that I have left over here, is I've actually cut it down on a slight angle here and removed this piece because I wanted more uniform thickness for when we sear it. And I wanted, for a presentation point of view, I wanted it to be uh, the exact same thickness right through, okay? The other thing you have to watch for, if you run your, your hand against the, the salmon flesh here going this way, so I'd be going towards the head, I can feel some of the pin bones that were left in. And I've removed from the other pieces, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull towards the head. So these are my, my fish pliers. I'm just gonna take the bone and just pull it back this way. And it's gonna release what we call pin bones, okay? If you pull the other way, you'll see that what it does is it tears the flesh, okay? So you'll notice right away if you're taking it the right way. And again, this is pretty good. There's not that much in here. Uh, and most of them I've removed from the other piece, but you want to get rid of those because again, they're unpleasant eating, okay? So for the bottom part of the salmon, you'll see again with these pieces I've completely scaled, removed the scales completely, and I've removed that belly part. So again, I've removed the skin here, saved this belly part and a little bit of the trim, which is exactly this piece here, okay? And what that's great for, think about a, a beautiful fresh salmon tartare or something like that, it'd be a, an amazing piece. Or again, if that's a little bit more work and you wanna use it for a chowder, you can absolutely do that as well, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna get rid of this salmon for now and just put it aside. And then we're gonna start working on our mango uh, relish, okay? So I'm just gonna remove my filthy cutting board. Remove my gloves. I'm gonna put my salmon away. I'll just put it in the fridge for now. And then we'll start working on the mango salsa. Okay. So hopefully you've all uh, received the recipes so you can prepare in advance. I'm just gonna get some of my ingredients out here so that we can uh, produce the salsa together. Again, very, very easy recipe. Now I provide recipes for you so you have the ability to produce it at home. But as we've talked about a couple of times when we do these demos, is that if you wanted to add more or less of something, by all means, it's completely up to you, okay? So if you're a garlic lover, feel free, add more garlic. If you don't like cilantro, then feel free to omit it from the recipe. It's completely up to you, okay? So I'll talk about a couple of tricks and a couple of the ingredients we're using. 
Again, very, very simple recipe. Uh, we're using some fresh honey. We're using some, and I talked about using a microplane for the ginger. I'll talk a little bit about that for fresh ginger root. I'm using some brunoise of red pepper, brunoise of uh, red onion, uh, one full mango, and uh, there's a video on our uh, YouTube channel that shows you how to properly clean a mango without excess waste. Rice wine vinegar, some fresh limes, garlic, and Thai chilies, okay? And, and I said Thai bird chilies, so typically Thai bird chilies are chilies that would uh, be dried, the Thai chilies that are dried, and the reason they call them Thai bird chilies is because when they dry, they curve and they resemble a beak. Uh, the heat level on these little peppers is pretty extreme. We made a hot sauce last night using three different types of peppers, and let's just say people were coughing all day. So they, they can get pretty extreme. I think it's 50,000 to 100,000 Scoville. So a quarter of these chilies inside the mango salsa is more than what we need, okay? Little trick in the industry about cleaning ginger. I know it's difficult to peel with a knife and there's a lot of loss, but if you use the, back, uh, use the front of a spoon and you just drag the spoon around, the side of the ginger, you'll be able to eliminate the skin and save a lot of waste. Okay, so just a little industry trick there. Feel free guys to ask any questions. If you have any questions along the way, and I'll talk you through any of the recipe that I can. I have my cameraman, Billy, will tell me what your questions are, okay? So again, very simple recipe. We're gonna get this made in advance. So we're just gonna empty all our mango into a stainless steel bowl. I'm gonna do a little bit of Thai bird. So I've already got it chopped up in advance. Sorry, Thai chili. Little bit of Thai chili, because again, it does have quite a bit of heat. Some minced garlic. Some uh, minced ginger, and we talked about using a microplane. A microplane actually is the name of the company. I think I have one here. The name of the company that we use, actually it's right here name of the company uh, that produces these uh, zesters and peelers. And what they do is it will eliminate a lot of the fiber from the center of the ginger and just give you the, the uh, pulp, the uh, flesh itself, okay? Some nice brunoise red pepper. Some red onion. Rice wine vinegar. Some honey, or you can use some agave if you prefer not to use the honey. Okay. Make a mess here. Some lime juice, fresh lime juice. And what I've done is I've rolled out the lime so that it, it releases a lot of the essential juice. So I'm just going to squeeze that. A little bit of salt, so some kosher salt. Cracked pepper. Some cilantro which I have over here. So they talk about a lot of recipes when you're doing fresh herbs that you're stemming them. With something like cilantro that has very delicate uh, stem, you don't need to completely stem it. I've just completely washed the cilantro in advance. Okay. And some really good quality olive oil here. And then always, whenever you produce anything, please taste it for seasoning, especially, okay? So let me see here. So I'm just gonna mix all those ingredients together. I love cilantro, I love garlic, love chili, so for me, there can never be enough cilantro. And I'm just gonna leave this in the fridge. I, I was thinking about this dish because I wanted to do something that reflected, hopefully, the weather we're gonna start to feel. Uh, so today's a perfect example. This would be a great relish for a barbecue. 
So a piece of salmon grilled, we're gonna be searing this one inside because I didn't know what the weather would be like. But to uh, produce a piece of salmon on the barbecue and serve with this rattle should be fantastic. I'm gonna do a touch more seasoning. Um, yep. Susan asked, did you grate the red pepper and red onion? No, so what I did, Susan, and thank you, great question. What I did, Susan, was uh, brunoise, we call it brunoising. So I've taken the flesh of the pepper, cut it in half lengthwise, and cut it very, very, very fine. So we call it a fine brunoise. But essentially, it's just a very small dice, okay? And all those ingredients were raw. So the, the peppers are raw, the onions are raw, part of my back. Uh, all the ingredients that we're adding to this salsa, and I'm gonna be serving it at room temperature. So there's no need for me to, uh, no need for me to heat it up. I'm gonna be serving it on a warm dish, so it's perfectly fine to be served the way it is. So all I'm gonna do is just move it to the side so that when we're ready for it, uh, when the salmon is seared, we're going to add it to the salmon, okay? So on to the couscous. So I'm not uh, sure how many of you are familiar with couscous. Uh, I brought a few variations because I wanted you to really see the differences and the distinction between uh, using an Israeli couscous or a pearl. It's also called pearl couscous. It's also called uh, Jerusalem couscous. So it has a number of different names versus a more uh, North African couscous. And uh, another one is called frigola sarda, which is very similar, but that's the Italian version of couscous, okay? So I'm gonna show you here some of the different variations. Okay, so this is the one that you're probably more familiar with. So this is a North African couscous that you think when you're cooking in a uh, an Arab dish or a Middle Eastern dish that has uh, use of a tagine and stuff like that. So that's more common. Some of the ones becoming more familiar these days in terms of using in a salad is this is the Israeli version. So the main difference with this one, the North African couscous is using a semolina flour, but you're actually rubbing your hands together to produce these five granules of couscous, okay? The Israeli couscous, now they're machined. Uh, the major difference, again, using semolina flour, these are roasted, okay? Dry, roasted. And then frigola sarda is the Italian version, and these come in varied sizes as well. So they can be larger, a little bit smaller, and the, you can see that the real difference is in the color. And the reason that is, is these are roasted in a, a wood oven, and it gives this real distinct roasted uh, coloration on some of the pearls themselves, but, it, but it's a deeper, and the reason they roast it, it tends to give it a nuttier flavor, okay? And we're gonna be doing a little bit of that in the pan when we were producing our couscous, okay? So I'm just gonna get rid of the ones we won't need. Um, Evan asks, uh, what's your favorite food and what's your favorite food to make? You know what, I hate to say it this way, uh, because I am born and raised Canadian, and I'm sure there's a lot of cuisine in Canada that I, I'm not familiar with, uh, but for me, I love a lot of the uh, things that would be foreign to us, so more ethnic flavors. So think of Thai food, Middle Eastern food, uh, anything that I never grew up on when I was younger, like familiar flavors, are probably the ones that I would say today are my favorites. But that's a great question, right? And, and guys, honestly, if there are dishes that you'd like to see, by all means, make some requests and we'll do that in the live version as well, okay? So I'm just getting all the ingredients combined and the flavors I decided to go with with this particular couscous was more of a Middle Eastern style, okay? So I'm using flavors that are familiar to a Middle Eastern background of, uh, I'm using ground cumin, cinnamon, garlic, some chili. Uh, I'm using a chicken stock, but by all means you don't need to use chicken stock. You can use just regular water. You can use a fish stock if that's what you wanted to use, but I'm using chicken stock because I made one and it gives great flavor. And I'm going to show you just how easy it is to produce uh, this couscous, okay? So you're going to follow me over to the stove. Okay, I'm just going to make a little space here, and then we're going to get started. 
Okay? Let's get my olive oil and I'll be back. Now, cinnamon can be quite strong, so I'm not going to use a great deal of cinnamon. I'm going to turn my heat on, and you'll understand why in a second. Turn my heat on medium to high. Again, using a really good quality olive oil. I'm going to put a really good quality olive oil in there. And what I'm going to start by doing is I'm just going to start by roasting some of my couscous uh, in the pot here, okay? So I'm only going to produce, because I'm only making two dishes today, I'm only going to do half the recipe. So I'm going to put half this amount into the pot here. And what you're looking for is you're looking for about uh, one and a half times the volume of liquid to one part of the couscous, okay? The weather is finally getting nicer outside. Everybody's outside except for us, but we're happy to be here producing this recipe for you guys. And thank you for understanding about yesterday. Next week we'll be back Friday again. Actually, uh, the request for next week's dish, I have a young gentleman named Aiden at home that loves macaroni and cheese. And he asked us if we could produce a version of macaroni and cheese for him to enjoy at home with his family. So we're gonna make a gourmet mac and cheese for Aiden for next week, okay? Uh, we're starting a program, so for the members that are involved with us today, we're actually launching a contest this week, starting on Monday. Uh, our fridge is ridiculous with leftovers right now of everything we've been cooking at home and recipes we've been producing. So we thought it would be fun to do a leftover challenge. So we reached out to the membership and we said that for you to produce a dish at home, you have to name the dish, you have to uh, use as many ingredients as possible out of your fridge or pantry or freezer, and then you have to uh, take a picture of the dish, so we want to see the presentation. And then what will happen is we'll give you $50 towards your first curbside uh, pickup uh, order. So it'll be a $50 win for whoever, whoever wins. And you email me your picture to my email at work, which is uh, wtucker at boulevardclub.com. Uh, and it's very easy to find. We're going to be launching it and sending it to the members next week as well. Okay? So all I'm trying to do here is develop a little bit of color by roasting uh, this pot, uh, the Israeli couscous again. It's going to give it a little bit more of a nutty flavor. For the frigola sarda, it tends to be roasted a little bit heavier, so that would probably be okay. But for this particular one, I'm going to roast it just a little bit, okay? Any other questions? Nothing, now. Okay. So here's where we start developing. I'm going to show you in a second now. You're going to start to see that... It's starting to brown just a little bit. And what I'm gonna do at this time too, I'm gonna to start setting my oven up for my salmon. Okay, because we want everything to be cooked at the same time. So I'm gonna set convection on my oven and we're gonna set it for about three, 350, I'll say, okay? Okay, so you can really start to see that some of the color is deepening here. That you're starting to get nice dark granules of, of the pasta, okay? So now is when I'm going to start adding my other ingredients, okay? So I'm going to turn this down just a little bit, and now I'm going to start adding some of my shallots. So these are just finely chopped shallots. I didn't want to add them in the beginning because they would burn before the pearl pasta had an opportunity to cook and brown. A little bit of garlic. And I'm just going to stir that in now, just develop some of the flavor. And we call it sweating, so I'm just sweating the ingredients to allow some of the essential oils and some of the flavor to come out of that uh, vegetable, okay? okay? With couscous, it's a lot easier to develop the flavor early. So meaning any of the spices that I'm adding, like the cinnamon and cumin and all that stuff, I would be adding now as opposed to trying to add it later on. So I want to build and layer flavor right now. So about a teaspoon of cumin about a half teaspoon of cinnamon, okay? I'm gonna add that Thai bird now. So 
So a little bit of the Thai burden, again, very hot, so I don't want to add too much. Uh, Susan asks, what could you use for a gluten-free option? Uh, gluten-free option? So, you know what, a lot of the, the rice pastas and stuff like that are on, or rice itself would be great. So if you're doing a rice dish, this is going to have a very familiar consistency to a risotto. So a risotto would be a great finish. But uh, again, anything, these are all wheat based obviously, but uh, rice would be a great option as well. Okay, so we're gonna add half that stock. And at this point, I'm gonna add a little tiny bit of salt and pepper, but not a lot, okay? Now all the, the uh, fresh herbs that we're adding at the end, so we, have, we talked a little bit about uh, cilantro. I have some chives too, if somebody doesn't like cilantro, we would go there. But now the time is I'm just going to turn down the heat a little bit and I'm going to allow it to simmer, adding a little bit of salt. I'm going to taste that water to make sure because it is a starch, it's going to absorb a lot of that salt. So I want to make sure that the seasoning is enough because at the end it's a little bit difficult to change and alter the flavor at the end. So the chicken stock has such great flavor. So a little bit of seasoning is gonna go a long way. And I can do a little bit of cracked black pepper as well. And that's how hard this is. Now I'm just gonna let it simmer. And when it gets close to the end, I'm gonna cover it. Uh, when, the, when the liquid is starting to evaporate, I'm gonna cover it and then just allow the liquid to evaporate at the end, okay? So I'm just gonna turn this right down and I'm gonna have my cameraman keep an eye on it for me as it's simmering. And then we're gonna get back to the other side and we're gonna start talking a little bit about the vegetables and the accompaniments to the dish, okay? So let me just get rid of some of this stuff, Billy. Really. Okay, so that's simmering away. My oven is going. Now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the vegetables that we're using today too. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about the vegetables that we're using today. So my choice only because of time of the year, asparagus is usually uh, in great demand and usually local by now. So what we've done, and we talked about the industry and people understanding how you prepare asparagus in advance, okay? So there are a number of things to consider. So this in the industry is typically what we would call pencil asparagus. Why or when you peel asparagus? Uh, this will give you an example. With pencil asparagus, anything that's this fine, I would tend not to peel it. There's no, no reason. Generally, when you get into a little bit of larger asparagus like this, the exterior of the skin has become a little woody and, and the root is very firm. So that's when you would peel them. Okay. What I would do with an asparagus like this is I would still cut them down to the size either. I mean, a lot of people talk about, okay, where you can snap it. That's generally where it's ready uh, to be prepared or, or the size. But for us in the industry, to be honest with you, all we do is cut it to the size that we want it to be. We'll take about a third of the asparagus off the bottom. And then with a size like this, what I'll do, so I'll show you with this, I would measure up against the other asparagus that I'm using. I would cut it down to size. And then very gently what we'll do is we'll peel it. So I'm gonna leave the asparagus on the board. And I'm just gonna very gently, just barely uh, running the blade of the peeler against the asparagus. And that's just gonna take some of that tougher exterior of the asparagus off, okay? Uh, when you're cooking asparagus, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what's essential when you're cooking uh, the asparagus. So with a green vegetable, to maintain the chlorophyll, you obviously need the water to be boiling and you need it to be well salted, okay? And the reason that is, now if you're preparing in advance, say you have a big dinner and you have a bunch of guests coming over and you wanna do as much as possible in the beginning so that you don't have to worry, what you could do is pre-prep your asparagus, have them all blanch and refresh them in ice water. And what that does is it'll stop the cooking process but it'll also maintain that bright green, beautiful vegetable color that we want to showcase when we're, when we're serving, right? So salt in the water, really, really important. Obviously no acid, so you don't want to put vinegar or lemon juice in there because it'll just change the color. Uh, and then a quick in boiling salted water, 
and then right out into ice water, okay? And that will halt the cooking and keep that vibrant green color. Uh, the way to store asparagus in the fridge, if you have the ability to and you have a nice big fridge, you can trim them down to where you want them and hold them upright so that the tips don't get destroyed and in a little bit of water and that'll just maintain them, keep them from drying out, okay? The extras, so the stuff that comes off after we've done everything, so what I would do, say we love asparagus at home and we prepare it every week and there's always this end product that you don't know what to do with and the peels even, okay? What I would do is put them in a small pail, put them in the freezer, and then whenever you're making asparagus soup in the industry, this is how we make it. So that beautiful green asparagus soup is made with all the bases and then what we'll do is we'll garnish with some of the tips. So we trick you a little bit. We use all our end product but produce beautiful asparagus soups, okay? So the other... <clears throat> The other thing we're going to use today, we talked about pan blistered tomato. So I go to the supermarket, I wanted to produce it using things that we all can pick up at our local supermarket. So these were available at Longo's and I thought they'd be beautiful for presentation. Uh, they're just stem cherry tomatoes and we're just going to cook those very lightly just in a, in a hot pan just to blister the base and just heat them up slightly and that'll be our presentation again. Okay? So let's move this aside. So we're going to bring our salmon back out at this point. I'm going to move our vegetables over to the stove. Moving our salmon over and we'll start producing our salmon, okay? What I'm also going to do so that everything is timed properly is I am going to start heating up the water in the back for my vegetable very slowly, okay? So we talked about a good amount of salt in the water in the back and I always talk about this when I'm cooking pasta as well is that the, the water in the back for the vegetables as well should have the salinity of the ocean, okay? So it should taste like ocean water. Okay, we'll take a look at our couscous here now too. You can see that we're getting to the point now that it's starting to take down most of the water. It's got that beautiful color from roasting it. I'm just going to taste it and see how much of a bite it has. Still got a little ways to go. And what you're going to see is very soon, I am going to have a little bit more salt though. But the flavor is great. I'm really getting that nutty. Uh, flavor because we toasted the couscous a little bit more. Okay, and again, like I said, the end product should be very similar to a risotto. Okay, so at this point, it's done. All I'm going to do now is cover it, set it to the back, and let it absorb the rest of that moisture. Okay? Salmon. So, really important thing to know about salmon. So, if you have a non-stick pan at home, fantastic. If you don't, a little trick we can use is if you place a little bit of oil on a good piece of parchment paper, don't use wax paper, please, but using parchment paper, place in your frying pan, and then that'll just keep it from uh, sticking to the bottom of your pan if it's not non-stick, okay? I'm gonna bring this up to uh, medium to high heat. And I'm just gonna sear these two pieces here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sear flesh side. I am not going to sear the opposite side, okay? So I'm just gonna do a little bit of cracked pepper, a little bit of uh, salt, and I'm not gonna flip this salmon. Once we get to the point where it's almost cooked, then I'm finally gonna turn it just at the end. But for the most of the cooking process, it's gonna sear this way down, okay? What I'm also gonna do here, can you pass me a little bit of paper towel there, please? What I'm also going to do here, because I really want the skin of this salmon to be crispy, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to dry off any extra excess moisture here, just to make sure that that skin is really, really crispy. And then I'll show you a trick that we use. So again, searing, I can use a nice quality olive oil here. Okay. And you're going to see the oil dance a little bit. And when it dances, that's how I know it's ready. Okay. But I don't want to add this to the pan until it's hot. 
If I do add it to the pan when it's not hot, you can see how it's pulling away from the sides. That means it's pretty hot. So what I'm going to do is always back away from myself. You can hear when, when it's hot enough, you'll hear the noise in the pan. And just a little bit more. Okay, and what I'm going to do is when I put it in that pan, I'm going to move it around a little bit, okay? And the reason I'm moving it around, that'll prevent this from sticking. If I have too much moisture in that skin, and I'm putting it in this pan, it can tend to stick. Okay? So again, I'm going to do the same with the other one. Move it around a little bit, just so it doesn't stick. And then I'm good to go. And what I'm going to do, I'm not going to rush this process. So I'm just going to turn it on medium to high. And I'm just going to let it sear. And when it gets about a third of the way up the salmon, so about, I start to see the browning just a little bit up, then I'm going to fire it in the oven. But you can see now the salmon is good. It's not sticking. Maybe this isn't the safest way to do it, but I've been doing this for a while, so I'm OK. Uh, but that's where we're at. Okay, I'm just going to place this other piece in the fridge. Any other questions, Billy? I'm, and I'm just going to wash my hands, guys, OK, while that's searing away. Okay. So you can see these are beautiful now. They're not sticking. Medium to high heat, we're good to go. I'm going to take a look at my couscous. It's starting to look really, really great. It's absorbed all that moisture. So you can see here, it's really starting to absorb that moisture. The longer it sits, that's going to happen for me. So that's good to go. And also what I've prepared here in advance is I have a resting rack. So as soon as my salmon's cooked, and personally I want to cook it to about 130, allow it to rest. I did bring a probe so I could show you. If I cook it to 130, allow it to rest, that's generally medium rare. So a little bit more than that, 140, 145 will be medium. And typically that's the way you want to eat it. Anything more than that, I, I think it makes it a little bit fishy, a little bit strong to eat. So, so personally I would prepare it medium rare, 135, let it rest. And that's generally the way we do it at the restaurant as well, okay? Also, you'll see when I take the salmon out of the pan, I am going to rest it on the opposite side. So on the flesh side, I'm not going to rest it on the skin side. And the reason that is, is if I work so hard to make the skin crispy, that if I don't turn that at the end and it sits in the oil, it will tend to be soggy again, okay? It'll absorb some of that oil. So we're just going to make sure that, that we don't do that at the end. Okay, I'm just organizing some butter. My French influence <clears throat> from cooking has always been using butter as, as a flavoring ingredient for vegetables and stuff like that, so I'm gonna do the same. And you see what I brought over as well? So we call this in the industry, this a fish spatula. Uh, generally it's thinner, more flexible, allows me to get under the skin, so that's what we're using to pick up the salmon, okay? If you don't have one, it's no big deal, but that's generally what we use, okay? So let me show you here what I was talking about in terms of the flesh itself. So you can see how the flesh itself, more on this side actually, let me just turn it around, has picked up a little bit of color up to about the third. Now is the time that I would put it into the oven, okay? So now I'm gonna start to put this in the oven as I prepare my vegetables. I'll be right back, just getting some cilantro. So what I'm doing, guys, is I'm just getting a little bit of cilantro for the couscous. And again, it's more just to bring those two flavors together. So again, in, in Moroccan or Middle Eastern cuisine, uh, they tend to use a lot of cilantro. So I'm just bringing some of that over so I can add it to my couscous. And I'll bring over my vegetables as well. Okay. Okay, so that couscous in the back now, like I said, it's really absorbed. I'm gonna turn off the heat here for the time being. Really absorbed a lot of that moisture. Okay, so I, there's a little bit of moisture in the bottom, which completely is fine. Uh, but what's going to happen is that's going to come together as well. A little bit of cilantro now. 
If you'd like, you can put in a little bit more olive oil, so it says as needed. Uh, I can add a little bit more olive oil at the end here if I feel that that's something I wanted to do. Mmm. Delicious. So I'm going to add a little tiny bit more good quality olive oil. And that's done. So the couscous is ready to go. Okay. Let me just mix that in. And really, really delicious and a great alternative starch, okay? So something that isn't as common as, as again, the regular ones, potato, uh, rice, the, the more common starches. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start heating up my pan for my tomatoes. It's going to be here, so medium to high heat again. I'm going to move my couscous to the other side for plating. And by the time I get back, my pan will be hot enough for the tomatoes, and we'll get that ready to roll. Have any of you tried any of the dishes at home since we've begun all this cooking, cooking videos? It's really been great to be able to produce some of the meals for you and see how simple it is actually, how difficult it looks when you produce it in the industry, but uh, how simple it is for you to make at home for your guests. Uh, Susan asks, can you talk about, re quote, really good olive oil brands? Uh, you know what? Actually, that's a really great question. Or what to look for. I, again, we, we talked a little bit about preparation and what the exact dish is. So this one I've been using for a couple of weeks now. I talked about it since we started doing the Italian dishes. And what I was looking for in this one, this is a little bit more peppery and, and has a little bit more of a bite than there are some fruitier alternatives. I talked about um, I talked about using a fruitier olive oil and you can use it in a dessert, which is something that we've done at the restaurant as well. Uh, you know what, the best thing is there's so many varieties out there is to talk to uh, the person that's either at the, the uh, particular specialty store because they'd be familiar. I mean, uh, Pasquale Brothers in Etobicoke, they must have 20, 25 different kinds of olive oil. So what I do as a chef is I go in, uh, try some of the different variations that they talk to me about what types of dishes we're preparing. And uh, they suggest some, I take them home. A good way to check it is for aromatics is what I do is put it in the palm of my hand and I'll rub my hands together like that and you'll get whether or not the olive oil is very floral. And uh, also to, there are also olive oil sommeliers now, believe it or not, that they can talk to you. And I believe Christina from Pasquale Brothers is an olive oil sommelier. And she can talk to you about all the different olive oils that are available and uh, what they work well with and sort of things like that, okay? But uh, there are so many great products on the market. It really depends on the dish that you're preparing and what exactly you want to what exactly the end result you're looking for, okay? Hope that answered your question. But this has been great, Provenzani, and I picked it up at Pasquale Brothers. But the one thing to remember is you are not going to be able to uh, get a, a great quality olive oil for really inexpensive, okay? It's gonna cost money, so you have to be willing to spend a little bit more to get a good product. So the tomatoes now, I'm just going to put flesh down. You can hear them sizzling. Just going to move them away. That's moisture coming out of the tomatoes. Okay. And I'm just going to put them like that. Move them away again. I'll move it towards me. Moving it towards the cameraman. And all I'm going to do is season them. So I'm just going to use a little bit of salt and a little bit of cracked pepper. Okay, you can toss in a little bit of flavored oils if you have. Okay. And if I have a lid at this point, what I would do is just cover it with a lid, maybe a little bit of moisture in the pan, and that's it. You're really not doing a lot here, okay? So I'm just allowing it to blister a little bit, just to give it a little bit more flavor, and go from there, okay? And I'm gonna take these out of the pan after they blister. I'm gonna just take a peek at my salmon.
So salmon's got a ways to go. So you'll start to see the base of them. See how they're coloring a little bit? That's what I'm looking for. Okay. And then what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to drop my asparagus now, okay? So boiling, really boiling salted water, dropping the asparagus in, and it's not going to take long. It's going to be in and out, honestly. I have a pot here that I'm just going to drop a couple of pieces of butter. Okay, those tomatoes are almost there. Yeah, that's better. So what I'm going to do now is just drop in a couple of knobs of butter into the tomatoes. And they'll be good to go, okay? And I'm just going to put that to the side as well. Now for the asparagus, that's about how long it takes, everybody. Okay, so all I'm going to do is take the asparagus up. Easy way to check. I'm just going to grab the base of the asparagus and just pinch it, and they're perfect. I want to have a nice bite with that asparagus. I'm just putting it in here into my strainer. Okay. And I'm going to season them up with some olive oil as well. And I have a couple of knobs of butter. So all the liquid out right into the pot here. I'm going to turn that off at the back. And we're good to go. So now the asparagus is here. Tomatoes are ready. Salmon is working. Okay. I'm just going to move my tomatoes over. And by that time, we'll be ready to flip the salmon and ready to go. The knobs of butter that I put in at the end, you're going to start to notice that they're going to start lightly browning. And that's exactly what I want. I want a little bit of a noisette just to get a little nutty flavor to the tomatoes as well. Okay. A little bit of salt in the asparagus. Cracked pepper. And there we go, okay? Let me just toss those around. I'm gonna bring my tomatoes over, turn off my asparagus, and finish the salmon. Okay, let me just clean up a little bit here. And I'm just gonna prepare all my ingredients for plating. So the asparagus is coming over. So right now what I have organized is I have some seedlings for plating. I have my tomatoes, my mango relish that we prepared in advance. Okay. I'm going to bring back over some olive oil. I have my Israeli couscous that we prepared in advance. And it's great. I might loosen it up with a little bit of uh, stock or olive oil when it comes to the time. I prepared in advance something to change things up a little bit. I did a little bit of a herb oil here. And I also brought some finishing salts, okay? So I'm gonna show you how all that's gonna work now in a second. We had good news this week that it looks like the clubs are starting to reopen. I know golf courses have, and we're making our plans to get back to the Boulevard Club, to the membership. So I'm excited about being able to offer them some curbside delivery programs and, and pickup programs. So we look forward to seeing you back at the club really, really soon. Okay, let's go back and take a look at our salmon now. So our salmon should be close to the halfway point. So you can see how it's starting to 
have a little bit of color. It's gone from being completely pink and now it's getting a little bit of translucency there. So what I'm gonna do now is using my salmon spatula, like, or my fish spatula, now is the time that I'm just gonna change and turn it over here, okay? Just like this. So what I'm gonna do is give it a little bit of color here, just a touch, but now is when I would allow that salmon skin to be nice and crispy on top, okay? But I'm gonna serve it perfectly medium rare in the center, okay? So we're just preparing everything for plating. I'm going to make some room here so you can see. Okay. So coming back over here, okay? So first thing, we talked about our couscous. So again, you can have it prepared that you um, can put it in a mold if you'd like to. We're just gonna spoon a little mound in the center here, okay? So again, really nice and fluffy, uh, has good amount of moisture so it's not a dry end product. You can cream it like a risotto if you'd like to. Well, we're just gonna put a little bit of that down the center, okay? My asparagus, what we're going to do is we're going to get a few pieces of asparagus here. We sieve four to five, it really depends on uh, how thick they are or how, many, how much you love asparagus actually. So I'm just going to put three this way, I'm going to put two the other way, just across the other way, so just a little bit of crisscross pattern there. I'm going to take those beautiful tomatoes, actually I'm going to wait on the tomatoes, I'll do the salmon first. So again, skin side up. I'm going to place that right in the center of the couscous and the asparagus. I'm going to have some of those gorgeous tomatoes along the side. Okay, so I'll let you see some of that. Maybe pull some of my asparagus out a little bit so you can see it. Now for the mango relish, I'm going to place that in a couple of different areas. So yes, I don't want to put it right on the skin because the skin itself will get soggy. So what I'm going to do is just spoon some of it down around the side. It'll add a little bit of drama and some presentation there, okay? Some color to the plate. If you want to put some on top of the salmon, I would maybe spill it down over the side, not necessarily right across, ruining all that beautiful crispy skin that we created. Okay, the herb oil that we have. So I'm going to use some of that herb oil and just pull it across the plate in different areas. That finishing salt, I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit on top of the skin of the salmon just to give it a little bit of that. It was unseasoned in the beginning, so that's the seasoning aspect. And then finally what we're going to do, uh, Billy, if you wouldn't mind passing me the olive oil back again, please. So we're going to put some beautiful herbs across the top or some garnish and we're going to finish with a really good quality olive oil. Okay, and I'll show you the dish everybody. So again that's your pan seared Atlantic salmon with spiced Israeli couscous, mango relish, pan blistered tomatoes and fresh asparagus. Thank you so much for watching everybody. God bless and we'll see you next week with Aiden's macaroni and cheese. Thank you.